far your word of truth. Thank you, God, that you continually reveal yourself, you reveal your ways, you reveal your heart, your love, your protection, and your deliverance for your children. Lord, we thank you for um, the book of Esther and how you remind us, even though you are not named one time in the book, you are all throughout every situation and the lives of your people. We ask that you bless our teacher this evening, and thank you for Karen and her preparation, and that you would just anoint her, and you would anoint our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive, and our minds to choose to obey. So we love you, God, and we thank you, and we ask that you be honored and glorified tonight in our midst, in Jesus' name. Miss Karen. Hey, ladies. Glad to see you back and some new faces. Um, you know, sometimes when we look at the news and everything that's happening in the world, right, some, uh, there are you know, all kind of crazy things that happen, but we tend to become kind of inwardly focused uh, and assess our current <laughs> situation, our current world, our current uh, uh, um, things going on in kind of sometimes a little hyperbolic terms, right? So we look at what's happening in the U.S. and we use words like intimidation, like persecution, like oppression, and words like that. And when that's not really the case most of the time, at least not yet, because all you have to do is look at other parts of the world and you begin to see that we really still have a whole lot of freedoms here in this country. You might know something about North Korea from last year when, um, when uh, all the stuff happened with the change of leadership back then. And, you know, we don't really know exactly what exactly happened there, it, except that the, his son, Kim Jong-un's son, is now in power. But most agree that things really haven't changed very much in that country at all. There's uh, prison camps, torture, forced labor, uh, threats of e execution, arbitrary punishment, restriction on travel, restriction on contact with the outside world is really common and really there's discrimination is widespread and there's almost nothing as far as uh, rights for women and children in that country and it has been like that since 1948. 1948, that's a long time. Multiple generations of that family, ruler, uh, family ruling that country um, with an oppressive hand over the top of all of those people and so this is about as close to a modern day example of what it might be like to have lived in Persia during the time of Esther um, in the time that Xerxes ruled. So we're back in the back half of Esther chapter 1. If you are new here we just have covered the first nine verses last week and we're going to pick up in verse 10 this week but so far we, in just that little bit a few verses we learned something about Xerxes and because he is the supreme ruler of the Persian Empire, and everyone in the realm was subjected to his whims of his rule. Uh, laws were written, and they were stamped and enforced with no explanation, no recourse, no appeals process, no human rights advocacy groups to uh, appeal when they didn't, you don't agree with them. And his laws were ironclad, and uh, they were meted out just as he felt. And we, we here in this country especially have very little experience of what it might have been like to live under a country like that because our country is full of due process, lawyers, uh, appeals processes, and all those kinds of things. But we have to remember that inside our safe little bubble of Western thought here that um, that's not the way it was historically and not the way it is for a lot of people in other parts of the world. Uh, specifically now Ukraine, if you're following the stories there, there's a lots of human rights violations there. Middle East, China, and we already talked about North Korea. Those are some of the places that um, don't have what we have here in the United States. But Persia was powerful during this time, and though we don't know a lot about Xerxes as a political leader, uh, we do know that he was a strong military leader, and that was really his focus, and he ruled by might. And remember what we said about the vast... Uh, Expanse of his rule. We looked at this map last time. All of the green was Persia during the time of Xerxes, and it stretched from India to modern-day Ethiopia, and uh, so it was a humongous empire. And what we just learned from the Book of Esther is we know something about his character as well: that he was easily manipulated and easily distracted, had a bad temper, 
and he was untrustworthy, he was impulsive, and so that's a severely dangerous combination for a ruler who had supreme authority. But uh, even in this volatile situation uh, that we'll look at in the rest of chapter one today, we'll see how the whims of this self-indulgent leader and the rebellious attitude of his wife, neither one of those th things can thwart the plan and the power of God. So just as a recap, chapter 1 opens with this huge demonstration of Persian military might. And if you here, weren't here last week, uh, a lot of people say, well, there was uh, this huge six-month party that was going on. But it, there was, uh, the, most of that time that they gathered together, it, it was just, it was not a party, but it was a giant display of Persia's military designed to get people to join Xerxes' campaign against Greece. And this little great, great part right there is Greece. And we'll see a little bit more next week when we talk about it, how he became completely focused on this little area of uh, the world. And um, this, so he called together the six-month planning session. And then as soon as that was over, at the end of that time, the last week of it was where the real party began. And last week, we got up to the introduction of Vashti, uh, it, who was his queen. And so there's this party for the men and this party for the women. That's where we ended up in chapter, in verse 9. And then there's uh, this, uh, at, uh, verse 10 says, On the seventh day, that's the last day of this big party, when Xerxes was high in spirits from wine. Now, you know what high in spirits from wine means, right? He was plastered. He was <laughs> drunk really bad. And I told you last week that the Persians drank alcohol not just to have a big party. They also drank it in, uh, as, as part of the decision-making process. That they would, they would drink, they would get drunk, and they thought that it, it, they could commune with the spirits and they would guide them to make good decisions. Now, this is just an aside. Let me tell you that Jack Daniels is a terrible life advisor. <laughs> I mean, he just is. He has led many people to ruin who have decided to make decisions while hanging out with him or his friends. And this is, a, this is an, an ancient example of that truth because Xerxes is going to make some really bad decisions now. And so Xerxes is hammered at this point, and then he calls uh, uh, Vashti, and the attendants are called to bring her before him, bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. So this is a no-win situation for Vashti, and the sources I read uh, study what this party was and why she had a party and who she was and those kinds of things. In the course of that study, um, I read that the only women that would be at a man's party would be prostitutes. So the noble women would not be at the man party. Um, so this is likely why she had her own party for the noble women. So for him to summon her out of the women party to come to the man party would be to degrade her to the level of a common prostitute. So, um, and he, it's clear what he wanted her to come for, for uh, these drunken men to ogle her, or worse, we don't know what else he had planned at that time, but uh, if she came, she would not only maybe be uh, disgraced physically, but if she were of royal blood, like we talked about some last week, then uh, she would be disgraced uh, in her, uh, uh, in, in her nobility would be disgraced too. So from, not only in front of the men, because once again she's called out of the man party to the woman, uh, uh, from the woman party to the man party, and that would have ramifications for her standing before the women as well. And remember this was in front of all the rulers and all the people from the surrounding areas, so coming back from this socially would be uh, really hard for her to do. Um, so. That's not to say she was probably this virtuous woman who cared about all those kind of stuff. things. She was probably just as self-absorbed as Xerxes was. But to say yes to his request, the damage to her stand, standing would have been immense. And, but refusing to, go, to uh, come carried uh, consequences too. So she says no, and predictably the king became furious and burned with anger. And so this is not a guy who likes being told no. 
uh, he's angry, and now he's really drunk, and in this terrible state of mind, he wants a resolution to the situation because the main issue here is he's embarrassed because his best girl has turned down his re request to come before him. And so he talked it over with his advisors. Verses uh, 13 and 14 is just a list of hard names of all his advisors. So jump to 15. And he says, according to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti, he asked. This is Xerxes talking. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then this guy Mimikin, who is one of the advisors, replied and said, Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. Go on to 17, for the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, so they will de despise their husbands and say, Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way, and there will be no end of disrespect and discord. Now, this is a, a little hyperbolic, right? I mean, he's gone from what should we do about Vashti to every woman in the whole kingdom is going to rebel in the course of four sentences. And so, this, but this guy's not stupid. He is an advisor. He's probably been around Xerxes for a good while, maybe, and um, he knows enough about Xerxes to know that he is a hothead, and he is also drunk, and he's got to act fast because one of two things is going to happen here. Either they're going to come up with a solution that, that calms him down, or he's going to turn his anger on the advisors, and they are going to be uh, executed, and a new group of advisors will be in before he sobers up. So, um, now the way uh, uh, many can talk to him and how he frames, let's, here's what we're going to do, is a little detail we need to pay attention to because it's going to show up later in the story, and that is Xerxes is easily manipulated by advisors when it's painted in a way that is for the good of the kingdom. And that's what he's getting here at the end is, you've got to do this to protect your kingdom. And uh, when it's framed that way, uh, he, he, he tends to do what they say, even though we'll see later on that he doesn't really care about the kingdom at all, only about his pleasure and what's good for him. So Mimikin suggested that Vashti be banished from the king's presence and get another queen. So that's what he says here in verse 19. Therefore, it pleased the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed. Now, that was a law that was stamped by the king. The law of the Medes and Persians, you might have heard that expression before, it just means that it's something that can't be changed. And that not even the king can roll back this, uh, this command or this law. So it went to stamp. That's it. You can't get back from it. So he, in the law of the Medes and Persians, which can't be revealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. So uh, you got to think that, um, that um, this edict couldn't be changed by Xerxes. And now whether actually uh, what happened to Vashti, whether she's actually killed or the, the effect of it was that she couldn't ever come back and so, to, into his uh, into his into his, into the court. And so basically, Mimikin is like, okay, you don't saying basically you don't want her anyway. Let's get somebody else better. And so uh, we got maybe uh, uh, Mimikin's a little self-serving here. We don't know about these uh, the uh, the rest of this, but. Um, Go on to verse 20 and it says, Then when the king's edict, edict is proclaimed, he liked the idea, throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. So he's got that little tag on. Not only are we going to get you a new woman, we're going to make all the women in the, uh, the realm subject to their husbands. And so maybe Mimikin has a little problem with his wife. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sounds like it, maybe. <laughs> but... Um, so the king and his nobles were pleased with his advice, so the king did as Mimikin proposed. And he sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, to each people in its own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler over his own household. Now the irony here, this is kind of funny a little bit, is that what they wanted to do is keep this thing that happened at the party here from blowing up into a big female revolt, right? 
But Xer and so Xerxes ruled over 127 provinces. You saw that map, map. huge kingdom, right? And this was in the days before social media, no Twitter, no, uh, no, no uh, Facebook, nothing like that, nothing viral happening. So how many of pe the people in all of those provinces do you think went on, you know what went on at that party? Very few, not zero, right? It's like, you know, there isn't even any, any indication that the people at the actual block party in Susa understood what was going on at the time. Maybe he was bragging to the people that were around him, maybe, maybe not, we don't know. Uh, but, it, it, uh, but for sure, everybody in the city of Susa didn't know what was going on. But how did they find out about what happened? By Xerxes' own order, right? <laughs> because he had it written, translated into local lang languages, and then dispatched throughout the course of his whole kingdom. So he's actually the one who told everybody that his wife defied him. And it's kind of funny, I thought. <laughs> but So that's where chapter 1 ends. And so we didn't get, we got a little bit further in the story. Now next week we're going to take, uh, we're going to speed up when we do a chapter at a time. But, uh, well, this is at the end of where we are now. And, but besides the beginning, be, being the beginning of an interesting story, what is the takeaway? I mean, remember the question I said, every time you read the scripture, what you need to ask, what uh, do we learn about God from this? So what do we learn about God from this? We haven't even seen God talked about. There's no... Nothing that seems to even be spiritual or anything like that happening in this section. Is there anything to take away that from here? Well, there is, because uh, here's where we start to learn and see God's fingerprints start to emerge just a little bit. Just a little bit. We're starting to see, uh, you know, what's going on here, and it will unfold as we move along. But there's five words of what your takeaway for tonight is from these verses. Uh, God is always at work. God is always at work, even when we can't see him, right? And that's the title of the study is Unseen. He's in the background, but he is always at work. Now, did God make Xerxes get drunk and fly into a rage? No. But did he overrule it? He absolutely did. Did he force Vashti to rebel? No. But did he overrule it? He absolutely did. Did he force Vashti into banishment? No. But did he overrule it? Yes, he absolutely did. Jumping a little forward in the story that we'll get to next week some, did Esther know anything about this party and the events that took place at the time it was occurring? Likely not. She's not invited to this party. She's not nobility. She's just a little Jewish girl. But did God have a plan for her that was brought about by it? He absolutely did. See, so she's probably 15, 18 years old, not much more than that at this time. So she's living in Persia. She's uh, going about her life, doing ordinary things. She gets up in the morning and she draws water, makes bread, does whatever she's doing, uh, goes to bed at night, not realizing that things are about to change drastically for her because of a, the events of a party that she was not a part of. And she was about to be catapulted through some really uncomfortable and dizzying set of circumstances directly into the providence of God. Now, this is the wonder of God's sovereignty here. He is moving and changing and rearranging and altering events that will advance his plan and will all the time. And this is going to come squarely into view as we move along in this story. But in the meantime... What do we here in the 21st century need to remember is that no one stops God's plan ever, ever. No one. Look at this verse from uh, the book of John. Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day, and I, too, am working. And this statement comes on the heels of him healing a paralyzed man on the Sabbath. And this was considered a severe breach of traditions and even sinful by the Jewish leaders. However, Jesus uses this opportunity uh, to remind them that God has never stopped working because of man-made traditions. God isn't controlled by our rules. He doesn't function on our schedules and, uh, or use only the things that we want him to use. Uh, God, Jesus does not hesitate to break our rules, uh, the norm, the status quo, and he doesn't mind picking hard things to bring about his will. 
It also means he doesn't halt his activity because we don't like it, because it makes us uncomfortable. Um, Psalm 121 is a poetic way of saying this very thing that God, that God is always at work. And it says that God never slumbers or sleeps. And as we as God's people have, must not fall into the trap of thinking that God is asleep when it comes to our personal lives or for uh, things going on in the culture or national or international events, things happening in, in, with our government, or when we see foolish people make decisions when they think they are in control, but they're not. See, he is not wringing his hands. He is not wondering what to do next. He is not, not confused when unfair, rash, or sinful decisions are made by people. He overrules it all. Scripture clearly tells us that God sets up leaders, the ones that we like, the ones that we don't like, and he moves people in and out of power, in and out of authority, on a global, national, and even in our personal lives, always for his purposes. And if you roll back to the first century, uh, when uh, right after Jesus died and the, the church was being established, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the tr church was just fledgling. They were just learning about their faith, and, you know, the churches were just a few years old. And we would have looked at it and said, now, Lord, you're going to protect them, right? You're going to just keep them safe while they learn mm -hmm. to stand on their own two feet, while they learn to figure out what's going on with their faith. But that's not what happened. Rome came in and crushed the new church, and we're going, wait, God, why? Why would you allow the horrific things that happened during the first century, and why wouldn't you protect them? But, uh, uh, but what persecution and difficulty did for that, those early believers was that it solidified their faith, and it scattered them all over the known world at the time, and they took the gospel with them. And what Rome tried to suppress by persecution actually served to spread it to the ends of the earth. Now, surely Rome and not the early church could see it at the time, but let a few years pass, and we can look back and go, yeah, I see what was happening there. So even in the pain, the loss of life, and horrific evil, God overrules. And he continues to do that, and his will is always done and that's so for us that's where our faith has to come in things don't go the way we like they, uh, we don't understand what's going on yes we need to pray yes we need to intercede for other people yes we need to be involved but we don't need to be anxious we don't need to be fearful god is working his will in spite of and through the decisions that ungodly people make Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Will we do that? Will we believe those things even when it doesn't make sense to us? Even when we have pain and when we have suffering? It's easy to believe when things make sense or when they go our way. But it's in, in the midst of what looks like chaos and it looks like hurt that we have to decide we're going to believe anyway. We're going to believe even when everything and everyone looks at us and says, your God has abandoned you. We have to choose to believe. God is at work. He is always at work, sovereignly guiding, sovereignly arranged, moving this piece here, moving that piece there. Uh, and you can rest in that truth. It should give you comfort. Uh, now, does that mean that we can predict his ways or we can kind of make him do what we want to do? That's not the truth either. Everybody knows that. We've tried, right? <laughs> and it doesn't work. Um, there's no way Esther knew what was going on at the time. There's no way she could have predicted what would eventually happen to her and uh, or how she would get there. This had to be super confusing and disorienting to her as this unfolded in her life. And we'll find out that next week. Um, it, but it's safe to say all of us have examples from our lives where we have confusing and disorienting things that happen to us. And we walk away from an event going, God, I have no idea what you're doing, Lord. I don't understand what is happening here. And we are confused. But, uh, but just like the believers in the first century, just like we learned from the book of Esther, a few years down the road, sometimes we can start to see his fingerprints all over events that hurt and confuse us. Uh, see, uh, he is fashioning. He is forming. He is bringing things about. You know, Persia's gone. 
Babylon is gone, Rome is gone, but the church of Christ remains. And that he, work, he is working out his will. And this is a reminder to us in our personal lives uh, and anywhere else that we have to settle in our minds and heart what we really believe. And stand on it that we as believers can watch the things that are going on in our world and be confused and shake our heads in disbelief. But we don't need to be dismayed. And we don't need to be fearful. This is why reading and studying and applying the scriptures is so very important. This is not a check off to-do list thing. This is where we settle and stand on our hope in Christ. Let me give you a verse from Romans at the end of the lesson today. It's uh, from Romans 14, uh, 15, 4. So everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, this is the point of studying Esther or really anything, anywhere in the scripture. Um, this is this is why we do it. This is what we get from it. Just look at that verse right there. Everything. Everything. That's Leviticus. That's Numbers. That's all the minor prophets that nobody ever reads. In our case, Esther, everything is written for the purpose of what? To teach us. To teach us that the whole point of us reading is that we would be learners. And so we need to position ourselves and posture ourselves before the scriptures and before the Lord as learners. That is, there is something that God wants to teach me here, and so I need to give myself to find it. Even uh, when it's, maybe even especially when it's difficult to uncover, hard to receive, and here's the crux, and hard to apply. It's like we have to remember that this is the God of the universe who is giving you a book and says, here, I want you to learn something. That ought to make an impact, and that ought to Call us to his word all the time. Teach me, Lord. You have something to say to me. And, um, you know, we need to be actively seeking and ready to receive whatever he would say to us, wherever it is, in the scriptures. And one thing we're always going to look for are lessons for two things. For endurance and encouragement. That is going to teach me to keep on Keep it on. You know, it's like, keep going, even though it's difficult, even though it's hard, even though I'm confused, that the, the, the scriptures help me build endurance. And they also give me encouragement. And the root word of that is courage. That it's going to give me courage to face whatever happens, whether it's in the culture out here, whether it's going on in my heart, in your family, wherever it is, that they are going to build courage through the scripture so that what? We might have hope. We might have hope. Now, hope is tricky, right? Because uh, what believers have is not the same thing as what the world has and describes as hope. The hope that the world has is something that happened that is beneficial or enjoyable for them. That's what uh, worldly hope is, that I want something beneficial or enjoyable to happen in the future. That is Hope it won't rain tomorrow because I want to go on a picnic. So it's beneficial, enjoyable to me. I hope my job will change this year because I don't like my boss. That is, I want something beneficial to me to happen later on that will make my me happy. Uh, you know, I want this health thing to get better because I want it to be, have more joy and I want to have more benefits. So it's I hope, I hope, I hope for this beneficial or enjoyable circumstance. And it's looking forward to the future to have that come in and change me somehow. But the hope that we have as Christians is not centered on what we will get, but what, on what we already have. And that's the difference between worldly hope and the hope for the Christian. We already possess the things that our souls most need and what we really want deep on the inside. And that is restoration, redemption, reconciliation, and that's the basis of hope. And our hope is based not on future change, but on past certainty. Okay, that is because my soul is restored, because my sins have been erased, because God has changed my life, because the Holy Spirit resides in me, because I'm never forsaken, because my future is secure, and because a whole lot of other things that we could go on and on and on about that are told to us in the Scripture— I have hope even when I don't get the beneficial or enjoyable things that I want to happen. 
That's the difference, okay? My hope isn't shaken by temporary things because it's based on eternal ones. And that's what the scriptures give us. It gives us hope. Hope that doesn't change. Hope that isn't shaken because it's built on what Christ has done inside us. So the story of Esther teaches us, it shouts to us, even here at the outset, that God is trustworthy. Nothing shakes him. Not political schemes, not ungodly decisions, not evil intent, not rebellion. It is all carried out under the sovereign rule of God. Nobody thwarts him. Nobody subverts him. Nobody alters his course. No body. Nobody. And when the world seems chaotic and we don't know what's going on and we scratch our heads in disbelief, and remember that one, the one who sits on the throne still reigns. And this is our call to be resolute in our commitment to, uh, to, to endure and to be encouraged that through, ho the hope, through the hope we have in Christ. Settle that in your mind. Be assured God controls history. Remember? Remember? And he controls the past, present, and the future. But he doesn't do it to make us great. It's that the work he's doing in us and his activity in our lives, that through that, we make his name great. The story of Esther, right at the beginning, first chapter, declares to us, fear not, be faithful, trust the Lord. God is always at work. Amen? God, we just thank you that we can trust you, even though it looks crazy. Even though we don't have any clue sometimes what's going on, and we uh, are confused. But God, settle in our hearts and just build strength underneath us through your scriptures so that, that we are not shaken, that we are not dismayed, that the words that come out of our mouth don't sound like the words of the world, that look for hope for things to change in the future so they'll be happy, but we can... Talk about things that are eternally true and that the things that you've done in our hearts, the things that you have changed. God, we thank you for the book of Esther and the, what we're going to learn through it and that we can know that no matter what goes on around us, you are always at work. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.